officials who has been contributing his knowledge and services for more than 22 years. He served many public institutions including the Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Railway and Transport, Sri Lanka Railway in an advisory level. He has also been an advisor and a consultant to the National Development Council and the National Planning Department of Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was asked to deliver the keynote address at this uh, very important occasion, in fact, I was wondering why I should do that. But then when Mewan explained that what is expected from me is to give an insight as to where the economy is going on and where the construction industry is placed in that, I thought, well, then there is some, something that I can probably share with you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me try to do that within the 25 to 30 minutes that is uh, 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 given to me. And bear with me if I step a little bit beyond that. I thought of uh, selecting a title, Construction of Our Future. That's because here we are with the Young Constructors Forum. And young constructors are having a long spell ahead of them. And uh, uh, it's future, basically. Young constructors are our future. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation today is going to be basically in three parts. Firstly, I'm going to give you some hardcore economics. Bear with me if it is dry. Let me make it uh, kind of uh, as, uh, as simple uh, as possible for you to understand. Then I'll try to position the construction industry within that. And then let me highlight certain uh, uh, things which probably uh, uh, should go into the policy making minds and also the professional groupings for you to consider for future action. We are all Sri Lankans here, mostly. There may be certain uh, 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 non-nationals. Bear with me for that. And we, as Sri Lankans, what is our objective? Our objective is to have a good future for us. Have a good future for Sri Lanka. I'm talking about the economic angle here. So, let me focus on one point where a lot of people talk about that economic development will have a cap somewhere that you will face a problem or you'll be trapped in a kind of a cage. When the incomes grow up, you will find that it will get increasingly frictioned so that your movement ahead is going to be slow. That's what we call frequently the middle income trap. And we are there today basically with the per capita income of about $4,000 and uh, we are nearing this apparent uh, middle income trap. What is middle income trap? It's basically, uh, the economists talk about not being able to raise the GDP, gross domestic product, we call it, the, the total economic product of the, 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 the country, above a certain level. So that's what we call uh, the middle income trap. There is a disagreement among economists regarding where this trap is going to be. Some people think that is somewhere around 15,000 purchasing power parity. And some people say they, that happens between $11,000 to $16,000 purchasing power parity. And some even think that it can happen even at $7,000. Now, with our $4,000 in nominal terms in dollars, the purchasing power parity already is uh, uh, nearing this 7,000 regime, I would imagine. So we are to be concerned about this possibility. Whether it's going to happen or not is another, another issue. Many countries in the developing uh, world have faced this scenario. Now why is this happening according to economic theory is because of some slowdowns. Let me try to explain those things in some sketchy ways without taking you through uh, 
a lot of economics on that. There are few slowing down paths. The first one is the growth of exports will be slowed down when the incomes increase. Why? Why? Because when the incomes increase, our labor costs go up. And the income increase, the consumption of the local resources go up. And then for the local production, you will have competition. And the competitive uh, resource utilization will make a kind of an additional pressure on the industrial competitiveness. And our export prices are going to be high. And that would have a dampening effect on the exports. That's the first channel that we can see. The second one that we can see is a consumption drive. When the incomes of the people increase, the people tend to consume more. And uh, particularly in a country like Sri Lanka, whenever you have money, you would be demanding more foreign things and you tend to value something foreign always. You tend to buy foreign things and demand foreign things. When you go to the market, there apparently is a demand for Lanka ala. Other than that, anything rata is where you place a value in this country. So when the people's income goes up, obviously they are going to consume more and more would they demand for imported products. So your imports are going to grow up. Look at this dilemma. Imports growing and the exports slowing down. The obvious outcome is widening balance of payment deficits. For you to finance that, you got to borrow. Now that's where your debts are going to go up. This is simple economics. Look at your family. If you don't earn and you spend more, the ultimate result is debts. There's a third element that is going to play another channel. When the consumption goes up, you earn 100, you spend 80, you have only 20 to save, and that's what you can invest. If you earn 100, you spend 90 for consumption, then you can only spend 10 for investment. So consumption increase would slow down or would, would, would uh, reduce the amount of resources available for investment. When the investment is less, it will be nothing but re reducing your future productive capacity, and that will be on the one hand, I will show you that link later. On the one hand, that will constrain your productive capacity. On the other hand, for you to finance that resource gap, you need to borrow. So you, all your capital projects, you need to go for foreign loans. So your foreign debt is going to go up. Now that's where the growth channel coming up. Increasing debts and reduced investment is a clear recipe for you to have slowed down growth. So this is basically what we talk about, middle income trap. There is another channel, I don't want to dwell much on that, that is based on the externalities, negative externalities, discharges, emissions, congestion, pollution, directly eats into the growth product. So that also is going to have a bad impact on that. So ultimately, your growth process is going to be constrained. Look at this. Now, this is what happened to Sri Lankan balance of payments since 1970. Only one year you see a positive balance of trade, that is in 1977, the last year of uh, Mrs. Bandar Naika. And the next year you see a huge uh, uh, drop of the balance of trade because you liberalized and people had money and they started buying uh, and then the dollar, uh, 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 the rupee uh, went down nose diving. And that's where we ended up in 1978. And ever since, we could not get into positive balance of trade in Sri Lanka. And in fact, when you really see the trend, it's something like this. It's not even improving. So isn't it what we have been hypothesizing through that model, that when you, when you have increasing your incomes, this is what might happen. This is the debts. Jatika Videsha Naya, the national debt, foreign debt. I just taken from 2000 onwards, uh, 2010 onwards. Look at the 
way the debts are going up. And I have the figures up to 2015 and we don't know where the 16 is still. I don't have that figures yet. So don't know whether it has gone up or down yet, but then when you see the trend, there is no chance that, uh, that, that uh, it, might, it might even... Uh, so this is where the debt problem is in Sri Lanka. Isn't that, that what we saw in the, uh, the sketch? The reducing exports, increasing imports, then the balance of payment deficit, and then the debts. Look at the debt service payments. It's even worse. Debt service payments, the red one, the red line is basically uh, external debt service payments as a ratio of exports. Remember that your debts are paid, particularly foreign debt are paid in dollars. Some uh, people uh, bluff the electorate in this country by saying that you can, uh, you can increase taxes and pay, settle the debt. Nonsense. You can increase taxes and settle the domestic debt. You cannot increase local taxes and settle your foreign debt because you need dollars. Domestic debt is less worrisome as far as I am concerned than the foreign debt because foreign debt will not only have an impact on our creditworthiness of the country, it will have an impact on our exchange rate, it will have an impact on our national sovereignty. A lot of people are going to tell us do this, do that and do the other because they are, they are our creditors. So all our independence, sovereignty, nationality, national identity, everything is going to be at stake when the debts are going to go up. Just for a matter of uh, 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 example, our debt position, now we saw the national debt position is about, foreign debt position is about 55%. And the total debt in Sri Lanka is uh, roughly about 70-75% uh, 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 as a ratio of GDP. Now we consider that as a, as a worrisome thing, worrying thing. But Japan has the debt to GDP ratio of 235%. So isn't that a problem for Japan? Why are we worried about the debts if Japan can manage with 235% uh, uh, debt burden as a ratio of GDP? The only reason is Japanese debt is 100% local debt. Japan does not have foreign debt. As long as you are not having foreign debt, you can, even with painful adjustments in the local fiscal policy and taxation, you can manage. Otherwise, you are in real danger. Look at that. About 60% of our, the red line going up, 60% of our export earnings going to pay for debt service payments. Really dangerous. In the model, I had the growth impact. Look at the growth scenario. Real GDP growth rate from 2010 to 2016. 2017, it appears like uh, we are going to have just 3%. Some people talk about 3.1% growth rate. Uh, in fact, it's pathetic. With all these liberalizations, giving up to all these uh, 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 um, conditionalities of the IMF and World Bank and everything, and, uh, and doing away all our national uh, uh, entrepreneurial decision-making capacity, this is what we are achieving. We had this uh, same 3% growth rate during that very tight controlled Mrs. Bandar Naika's regime in 1977 also, before 1977 also. So are we, uh, are we not having a problem? This is, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to plant in your mind as a seed before I want to go and discuss uh, uh, the construction industry. This is just one slide to show you how our national uh, uh, flow of non-factor incomes. That means the salaries and the profits that we earn from working abroad and the salaries and uh, profits that we pay abroad, this is what is happening to Sri Lanka. So basically, it looks like the GDP to GNP ratio, that is national product to domestic product ratio, is deteriorating. It is really dangerous because that may be an indicator that the Sri Lankans are losing the Sri Lankan ownership of economy. Because our economy apparently is now increasingly owned by non-nationals. That may be one indicator of this trend. Ladies and gentlemen, these trends that we discussed can be further accentuated by the low investment productivity. That I don't have to tell you. When the investments are made which are not productive enough, you have 
this situation for the aggravated. Inadequate inventions, innovations and research and development, we'll discuss it in a minute later, how important that it is. An inappropriate policy framework, a lot of people talk about it, I don't want to waste time on that. Wasteful spending, we'll discuss in a minute, and corruption. It is within this setting that we move on to discuss the construction sector. Uh, I'm going to place the construction sector within this macro framework with another set of figures. You are all constructors, ladies and gentlemen. You, you can be happy about these statistics. In fact, I also did not realize until I started preparing for my talk that the construction industry is doing this sort of, uh, 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 having this sort of profile in this country. Construction industry is generating a value added. That is basically the share of the GDP. In current 2016 prices, a little less than 1 trillion Sri Lankan rupees. So you are a trillion rupee economy producer in this country. That will tell you many things. I don't think you are exerting your pressure enough to the policy makers. This is your strength. And it represents nearly 8% of the gross domestic product. If the gross domestic product of the country is 100%, with education, health, transport, uh, uh, agriculture, paddy, tea, rubber, coconut, garments, tourism, everything, you are counting for 8%. This is direct. And I presume that when you take the indirect contributions by the construction industry to the economy, this is even more. But these are direct from the national income statistics published by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And it contributes by generating 9 billion worth of service exports. Uh -huh. Aha. You are also exporting services. That is construction exports are also there. Rupees 9 billion worth of construction exports. I wonder, there may be a lot of Sri Lankan firms doing business abroad and bringing foreign income. You should be proud about it. And you provide over 6 lakhs of direct employment. The direct employment. And I'm sure there are, are many more indirect employment in the, in, the, in the construction industry. I don't think the basunas and carpenters and all these things are counted in this. I don't know. These may be the, the formal, formal uh, uh, direct sector. And other than that, the construction industry is pulling many other activities in the economy through economic linkages. And also it's directly related to provision of basic societal needs, the shelter, water, food, you need irrigation, you need water systems and mobility, you need roads, railways. So you are basically driving the societal needs producing sector. And you also contributing towards economic efficacy by cost-effective energy supply, by uh, speedy mobility, speed transport systems, you are contributing to the national production efficacy also. And you are contributing to the social welfare. Schools cannot, health education system, health system cannot function without hospitals and schools. So it's basically the construction sector which is shouldering the, the infrastructure necessary for those. And human safety, the construction norms, standards, etc. That's you are the professionals who are driving it. If a building collapses, if a road collapses, if flyovers collapse, the railway tracks get uh, 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 you know, um, not uh, train worthy, then, then, then those are problems. So you need construction professionals and they are the ones who are the guardians of uh, uh, safety and also the technology development that's where the inventions innovations and research and development do come in unfortunately this is an area where Sri Lanka has been lagging behind and we have been forgetting about it but the construction sector also have some alarming trends now I gave you the positive side let me give you some uh, alarming trends also now I'm asking a set of questions from you, professionals. I'm just, give, I'm just reading the statistics, so I may be wrong. 
Is construction sector stagnant in this country? That's my question. As a share of our economy, is it coming to a kind of a stagnation? We'll see the graphs later. In fact, I have done it animated, but I'm un unable to uh, point the, 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 the uh, pointer to these question marks and changing the slides. So let me finish this uh, set and then go to the, uh, the graphs. Is construction sector becoming increasingly import intensive? Uh -huh. Is construction sector driving the imports of this country? Is the construction sector representing an increasing share of total imports? Out of the total imports, is the construction sector's share is going to grow up? That means, are we importing more than the other sectors? Or is, is the growth rate is faster? And also, whether it is losing its respectable domestic footprint. Now, we call carbon footprint, we call other footprints. Now, we have a domestic footprint. Construction industry is something where we have a very strong, we had at least, a very strong domestic footprint. Are we losing that? Now, those are the concerns that I am seeing. Now, this is the national statistics showing. From 2010 to 2016, the construction sector's GDP share is kind of plateauing at about 8%. Now, that means, are we going to be stagnant, just like the middle income trap? Is the construction sector going to be just there forever? Now, this is construction sector's uh, balance of trade. That means, the construction sector's exports minus construction sector's imports as a ratio of the construction sector's value added. That means the construction sector GDP. We have been having a positive trend up to about 2014 and started nose diving thereafter. That means what? Either our construction exports are slowing down or our construction based imports are growing. It is a matter for concern. This is the construction sector's share of the total imports. Look at what's happening to that. I, I would blame the construction sector now for our exchange problem. It's not only petroleum which is now driving the exports in this country. It looks like the construction sector is also driving the Im imports of this country. We were about 6% or even less. Now we are topping about 8% and going up. That's a matter of concern also. The worst is this. I told you uh, we had a very strong domestic footprint. 80% or even about 70% of our construction sector, the terms of trade ratio, that means what? The construction service exports minus construction service imports. Our construction companies doing business abroad and making money. And our construction sector is served by the foreign companies here and then repatriating profits. The difference between the two, the two is basically construction service exports minus construction service imports. Construction service exports to construction service imports, we had a healthy ratio of about 70% right up to about 2012. Look at the level today, just 30%. What happened to us? Does this mean that have we lost our foreign uh, 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 contracts? That our, our people have lost business in other countries? Or is it that our economic opportunities in the construction sector being dragged by the foreign companies? I am talking to this audience as a Sri Lankan. So if there is any non-Sri Lankan here should not get uh, alarmed with that. What is happening? What is happening? Are we losing steam in our construction industry? Or oh, at least some signs of being uh, 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 sick? Becoming same as those paddy farmers who buy imported rice at supermarkets? Are we going to that level? Or are we becoming those uh, Putu Aneti Waduo? Who are getting their chairs manufactured elsewhere and buying? Has the same virus started infecting the construction sector also? The same virus where we, we go and get penetrated uh, every cell of your body by a virus? 
In agriculture sector, the virus is there. In the industry sector, the virus is there. In the education sector, everything, the virus is there. Has the construction sector also got the same virus now? Why are we not exploiting the national construction demand to promote local construction entrepreneurship? Why can't we make use of the national demand of the economy for construction to promote our local entrepreneurship? Would it not deprive us of the opportunity to create national multiplier effect? I hope you understand multiplier effect. Multiplier effect is when you, when you plow back your expenditure as income to someone and that becomes an expenditure to someone else and that plows back into the economy every time it spends. That is why in the economics we talk about think twice before you eat a piece of bread and eat some uh, rice with polsambola is much better in economic sense. Why? Because your expenditure on the, the, the piece of bread is going to land up in the United States, whereas you eat with uh, uh, polsambola your rice, that ends up somewhere in Anuradhapura or Polonnaruva. And that expenditure you make is going to be an income to someone else, and he makes another expenditure to buy a, a shirt or something, and that becomes an... These are called multiplying effects. The moment the chain is broken by repatriating the money, the multiplier chain is broken. So it's very important in an economic sense that you make maximum effort to multiply your expenditure. And also, isn't it important that we gain experience? Let's discuss later about that. Isn't our increased dependence on foreign construction imports highly expensive? That's another matter to concern. Now I'm going to talk hereafter, getting into the other picture as a practical uh, a scenario where, uh, uh, where my experience is going to be shared with you on the railways and the road sector. Now these are some uh, uh, road sector analysis uh, that I have done. The x-axis reflects different financing modes. Government of Sri Lanka, World Bank, ADB, Japan, EU, Korea and China. These are the, these are the uh, uh, financiers or lenders for these projects. And uh, costs are given there. Cost per meter kilometer. A meter kilometer of a road. Look at the top circle. Those are all bilateral credit, no competitive bidding, just negotiated. And look at the government of Sri Lanka finance projects, which are basically going to you as local contractors. And this is what you are getting and that is what the others are getting. Isn't it a crime? Why can't you ask for something more and go and compete with those people? Isn't it the duty of the policymakers of this country to pay that high to you? Isn't it your duty to ask for it? This is railway track construction. Look at the last uh, row first. Local construction of track between Vaunia and Omanta. I am proud to say that it was done during our time. Done perfectly by the Sri Lankan local uh, railway engineers. Without any equipment, without any technology, just um, manual things. You will see some photos later. Less than 0.4 million dollars a kilometer. Less than 0.4 million dollars a kilometer. That's the cost we spent. This is even give, putting in the railway workers' salaries, which anyway is paid, and theoretically you should not even put that. But to make it comparable, we have even put the, the salaries of the railwaymen. 0.4 million. And you go tomorrow by uh, the Intercity Express train to Jaffna, Make sure that you make a note between Tandikulam and Omate, 13 kilometers of the track, 100% done by the Sri Lankan engineers, as best, as equal as the rest of the track done by Indians. The train runs at 100 kilometers per hour. Prime Minister appointed the committee to go and see that, and I went in the engine uh, with, the, with the expert team, and they realized, and we clocked 100 kilometers per hour on that track without any problem. 0.4 million. Look at the expenditure that we have uh, made uh, to give for foreign contracts. Talemana track to India, 2.2 million dollars a kilometer. Jaffna railway track, Omanta Palai section, beyond uh, the Sri Lanka railways uh, section, 1.9 million dollars a kilometer. 
and Jaffna railway track Palai Kankasanthure, the, 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 the next 56 kilometers, 2.6 million dollars a kilometer. Matara Beliata, the, the track done by the Chinese, 9.2 million dollars a kilometer. Sri Lankan poor railway worker is doing it at 0.4 million dollars a kilometer. A minya get over time make a podak pack why do you not think of your prasna hano? Pau! Why can't the local entrepreneurs be given this chance? This is not rocket science anymore. This should be done by the Sri Lankan uh, entrepreneurs and uh, constructors. The worst is signaling project. Railway signaling construction. If you read the newspapers on Sunday Times, May 7th, 2017, there was a news item. The local construction of signaling at Nara Hempita Station with state-of-the-art technology, perfect technology, locally done, locally designed, imported, of course, imported material and equipment because we don't manufacture those things in Sri Lanka. Approximately 0.1 million per station or rupees 16 million in terms of 16. I will ask you a simple calculation. 16 million dollars a station. Tell me the price for four stations. 16 into 4, 64. 64 million Sri Lankan rupees. That's the price for four stations. All right. And you calculate for the cable, the fiber optic cable for 27 kilometers, maybe about another 100 million. So 100 million plus 64 million, you should be able to do 27 kilometers of signaling, four stations, perfect state-of-the-art technology, locally manageable at 160 million maximum. Signaling, Northern Lines, Madhavachi, Talemana, done by India, approximately $3 million. And the funny part is, the contractor who got it from us apparently has subcontracted to someone else and got it done at 0.25 million dollars. And that subcontractor also is Indian. So Sri Lanka got indebted at a rate of 3 million dollars and got the job worth 0.25 million dollars. And this is there recorded by the Priyal Silva committee report. Priyal Silva is one of the one of the. Uh, most uh, uh, respected railway engineers in this country and he, he, his commission report uh, is highlighting this. One tenth. The proposed signaling of the 27 kilometers between Matra and Beliata with four stations, Chinese contractor has got it for 3.7 million dollars a kilometer. Abhi rupiah lo linki no nang? Rupiah million dedas desi hai what you can do at 160 million rupees. Don't you consider this a crime? None of these are competitively bidded. All are negotiated projects. And those are all bilateral lending. And they tell us, here is the money, give it to us. That's all. And we should have the backbone to say, no, give it to us, we'll do it. That's the duty of Young Constructors Forum in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, mind you, in investment there are two things, the real investment and the book entry. What is real investment? Real investment is what is going on to the ground, the real worth of what is being constructed. And the book entry is what is recorded as debt or what is recorded as the investment in the national figures. Now that's the size of the real value of investment. I just try to caricaturately present it. And this is the book entry. And within that, the real size. The crime in the construction industry today is that the economic growth is driven by the real physical capital and not by the book entry. Because the economic drive is, depends on the number of activities that you did and the quality of it doesn't depend on how much you spend on it. Whereas, the crime is national debt expansion is driven by the book entry, not by the real value that is spent. 
on the one hand you are spending unnecessarily high amount of money getting indebted and getting the future generations indebted on the other hand you are getting peanut worth of things done from those companies just to summarize foreign construction projects executed on bilateral lending not competitive will be dead and thus corruption prone our policy makers will have uh, gala time to negotiate and get their shares extremely expensive extremely expensive and investment unproductive as i showed you because the growth productivity comes up through the not by the amount of spend by the, the the real value wasteful and debt creating draining national resources away depriving us of experience and skills development and also depriving us of opportunity to invent innovate and develop technology ladies and gentlemen i just want to talk about a bit on invention innovation and technology development i hope you have read this at least somewhere alut alut da notana na jatiya lowa nonangi hinga kama bari unu tena lagi gaya maragi you would wonder when was this said and by whom this is kumaratung munidasa saying this in 1938 and i used this in my doctoral thesis when i did my phd in france and i translated this into french and put it in my thesis and my supervisor asked hey if you had these kind of things 70 years ago in your literature how come that your country is there if you don't develop new things the country has no future unfortunately we have to ask a question before doing new things we have to at least continue doing the things that we have been doing earlier letting alone doing new things alut alut there it looks like we are giving away the things that we have been doing up to now that's why 150 years down the line we have been doing the railway tracks and my father in law was a highways engineer and no longer we are in those businesses and we have not grown up into that level why are we not capable of meeting these things are we simply not interested these are good questions to ask no we are capable these are some examples broadening of the kv line we just discussed a few hours ago uh, those experiences double tracking of panadura kalutara section polgavela rambukana section ragama jayala section the years are there the third line to ragama mihintale railway kalalai signaling up to rambukana great effort of tsunami reconstruction when the entire country was just trying to recapitulate as to what had happened the railway went in and constructed it hope you can remember this this was the day after the tsunami disaster look at the railway line this is how the railway line was these were the railway lines uh, uh, pictures in the coastal area this was the ill-fated locomotive we did it in 56 days when the foreign contractors were asking 2 years on the 7th of march the trains ran to matara and when rubbish was still the rubble was still there on certain places dumped in other sectors of the economy so we have the possibility courage and the capacity of doing it just don't underestimate our capacity this is the same locomotive rehabilitated and still on the track running our recent achievements i told you narahempit and nugegoda railway station signaling 2017 fourth line between fort and maradana 2010 tokenless signaling system between peradini and kandy 2009 track construction beyond vaunia up to tandikulam i told you one fifth the cost of the foreign contractors this is how we did it so photographs beyond vaunia look at them there's just manual workers no equipment give them some equipment they'll do wonders look at their look at how they do it just by manual uh, uh, things and these were launched just manually and just a uh, uh, age old crane only that they had and these were these were done 100% locally so we can do it we can do it
I need to wind up because I was told that I'm stepping beyond my time now. I want to keep some interesting things in your mind. Lao Tzu was a Chinese philosopher who was living during the Buddha's time, 5th century BC. This is what he said. If you hear something, you're likely to forget it. If you see something, you're likely to remember it. And if you do something, you will learn it. And if you don't do, you will never learn it. That's the lesson. In Sinhalese, Daka Purudha Pamanak Madi. Kala Purudha Tavashyai, Pala Purudha Tavashyai. Kala Purudha Gyanne, Adya Kiming Gyanne Gyanne. Pala Purudha Gyanne, you gain the expertise. And you get the Pragunya. And if you don't do that, then you are killing the future. That's my message to the Young Constructors Forum. If you don't do that, it's not only that you are killing the future, but also you are doing a disgrace. You are making it a disgrace to your past ancestors. This is Abhayavava. Done 5th century before Christ. These were our ancient constru constructors. R. L. Brohier said in his book, if any modern engineer trying to find out the fault in the ancient Sinhalese engineer's work, the designs, he will sooner or later find that the mistake is with him and not with the ancient Sri Lankan construction engineer. This is the best example you can cite. Because when they were doing the Maduro air dam, they designed it according to the best technology that they had. And they started digging and they found exactly at the same location the old Sorova. And this is where they had to redesign it to preserve it because it was exactly at the same location. Done thousands of years ago, they knew the technology was there. And Sir Henry Parker says, the inventors of the well pit was Sinhalese Sri Lankan engineers 2000 years ago. This is what we call Bisokotua. Now we are the inventors. So young contra contractors, young constructors, you are going to be the inventor investors in the future. Inventors in the future. If you don't do that, then you are not only, not only ruining yourself, but being disgraceful to your ancestors. This is Yodala. Yodala is uh, 6 inches per mile, that is 1 into 10,000 gradient. Maintaining such a gradient is an extremely challenging task for even modern engineers with lot of technological and scientific support. So these are the things that we have done. Ladies and gentlemen, let me end up my talk by saying, we can do and we must do. It's only if you do it, you get the expertise and you can march forward to the future. That's the only way towards construction of our future, ladies and gentlemen. Can we play the music? Because this is a song written by one of our former presidents. Premadasa, who went and saw these things and showing it to his son. So hope his son also will work according to the lyrics of this song. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunaruan, for sharing your interesting and enlightening thoughts with us.
Let's take a quick break now to listen to the lovely voice of Dimitri Gunatilekar once again. <laughs> 